uh, something is going on in our family where it's just passing from one person to another. So if I didn't shake your hand or if I ran away when I saw you, please uh, don't be offended by that. I, I also take um, no responsibility for what I say today. So if, if somehow a fever just started when I started preaching, I don't know. So don't get mad at me. No angry emails or phone calls or anything. But Well, why do laws exist? Are they for our good? to preserve power for the powerful? Or or maybe there's some kind of combination of the two. In 2013, a movie was released with an interesting premise. What would happen if just for one night a year, all crime became temporarily legal? Now, I didn't watch this movie, so don't worry. I've read the Wikipedia page. I know the premise of the movie. It's interesting, though even though it's far-fetched. It's a fictional account of what would happen if there were no laws preventing people from doing what they really wanted to do. Many of us have heard this question at a party. What would you do if you knew you could get away with anything? Would you rob a bank? Steal something? Hopefully no one would harm anyone else, but human history shows us that when restraints are removed, when we're taken out of a legal system, something comes in and fills that void. The 1954 novel, The Lord of the Flies by William Golding is a good example from literature of this. In this story, a a plane-carrying young schoolboy crashes somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. And as the boys are are trying to keep some sense of order, they create fantastic myths about a creature, a beast on the island. Alliances are formed. Leaders are chosen. And and it doesn't take too long before these well-educated British schoolboys turn into primitive warriors. The question that we interact with in stories like Lord of the Flies and, and also our own heart is why does this happen? Do we simply devolve into anarchy without any restraint? And if so, what causes this plunge into chaos? Well, the Christian answer is clear. It's because this is inside of all of us. Put in the right situation, even the calmest, most gentle person can become a cold-blooded killer. It sounds extreme, but have you ever wondered how someone could do such terrible things? We, we see these terrorist acts. We, we see people hurting each other. We see road rage from people who are normally calm people. We see people who torture children, do horrible things to one another. And we think, how can anyone do that? It's, it's hideous and it's terrifying. We want a world of picket fences and doors unlocked. We want safety. But what happens when our hearts and desires are released, allowed to be free from the constraints of law and order? This may shock you, but we find that we're no different than the murderer or the abuser. We're no more advanced than an island of schoolboys in the middle of an ocean who hurt each other. Laws that are on the books and that we obey shows us what we would do with no restraints. And in the Old Testament, God gave laws that the people were to follow. But something happened. Something always happens. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They kept on disobeying. And this is where we're at, and this is what some of the people in the Galatian churches, they were trying to go back to this system that they could not accomplish. And this is what Paul is writing to. He's pleading with these churches to come back to the truth of the gospel, come back to the power of God's message of grace and mercy, because they're moving away. And this is where we pick up in Galatians 3. This morning we're reading verses 15 through 18. Paul writes, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. 
This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. First thing we notice in verse 15 is that Paul calls these people brothers. Now don't get too hung up on that, that this is just a a way of greeting in the ancient world, but today if it were modern, he would say brothers and sisters. He would say fellow believers. But the term brothers, this, this family term, it has a closeness to it, doesn't it? When I shake your hand, I may say, hey, good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. There's a reason for that. You're not just a stranger. You're family. Paul saw these people as foolish, as people who were heading down a dangerous path, but he still saw them as his family. Now, this is an important distinction because it shows us that we need to be very careful about breaking fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We need to break issues over first importance. If someone denies the Trinity, if someone denies Christ, if someone denies the inerrancy of the Bible, we ask them politely to leave. You're no longer part of our family because we don't think you're a believer. Church discipline does the same thing. If if someone is living in outward rebellion, we ask them to leave or we tell them to leave because they are no longer outwardly showing signs of them being a believer. Here, In Galatians 3, we may say, well, wait, they're doing that. These Judaizers are coming in and they're messing up the gospel. And they are. They're misrepresenting it. It's an essential issue. But you've got to think that Paul knows at least the leftovers, the remnant enough to know that there are still God-fearing, God-loving, gospel-centered believers in these churches. They aren't far from abandoning their faith, but Paul believes they can be restored. He has hope. He has hope that God will be glorified through this experience. So the underlying question for us are are really, there's three big questions. First, what makes a family a family? And this is what we're looking at here. Number two, who are the real children of Abraham? Or who does the blessing come from? And then the third one, is it those who follow Moses by keeping the law? Or those who follow Christ alone? who inherit eternal life. Now reading this passage, you may think that this sounds like a legal argument. Covenant, annul, ratified, those are are legal terms. And if you don't know the context, you may not understand this. And, and, And so what Paul's saying is not that hard to follow. Now so look in Genesis, God promises that Abraham will be a blessing to the world. Not just to his people, but to the entire world. This is what God wanted to do. This was God's plan all along. So Abraham was given faith, and then Abraham believed in that order. Over 400 years later, God gave Moses the law. And from the beginning, the law was burdensome. What fabrics to wear or not to wear. What food you can or cannot eat. Who to marry, who to mingle with, how you can worship. It's clear to us today that no one, not even the the best behaved or the most well-intentioned person, could ever keep all of the law. It causes a problem. The law was given to show people their sin and to point them to the promised Messiah. In essence, the Old Testament law, every word of it, points us to Christ. Christ. But the statement that Paul makes may not make any sense to you. It's not how our legal system works. If you go make a will and you write a family member's name on there and then a year later that family member does something to make you mad, you can go to a lawyer and take their name out, right? We could do that. But but that's not what Paul is saying. Paul, Paul is saying you can't do that, right? It seems to contradict this. But doesn't Paul's words sound a lot like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son? Where, where the father gave the son all of his inheritance and he, he gave them all of it. The son goes and squanders it and comes back. And the father doesn't say, well, I want all that money back. Because legally he had no right to do that. He had already given it away. It was done. It was signed. It was sealed. It was once and for all given. So if you read through the Old Testament, it may seem like God gave Abraham one covenant or one way to salvation. And then he gave Moses another God is not the author of confusion, though. 
Is there multiple ways to to find God? This is what the world will tell us, right? That that no matter what religion you follow, no matter what branch of Christianity you follow, no matter what cult you're in, so long as it works for you, that will lead to God. That's what, what we hear, isn't it? I can't be here. God is the author of Scripture. He he is not the author of confusion. So how do we square this? Well, as you study passages like this, those require some unpacking. Remember that God's purposes have never changed. From eternity past, God knew that his creation would rebel, and he knew that there was only one way to make humanity right with him, and that required a sacrifice. Those animals that the Israelites and the the Jews killed thousands of years ago had no power to save. They were animals. They were pictures of the last and greatest spotless lamb who would save his people from their sin. And, And that's really what Paul is trying to get the churches in Galatia to remember. Remember that the sacrificial system, remember that the law, it has no power to save anyone. It is through Abraham's faith, not his obedience, that God blessed him. The promise was not dependent upon his behavior. Does that sound familiar? It should. Isn't that the same way that God deals with us? His promise of forgiveness of our sin is not dependent on what we do. If it were, we would lose it the minute that we open our eyes every single morning, wouldn't we? There's freedom in knowing that it's not how much you can do for God that somehow you're moving up the ranks. There's freedom in knowing that that is not how God operates. But Paul knew. Paul knew that the world would reap the benefit of a God-given faith of Abraham. And in verse 16, he uses the word offspring. The point here is that the entire world, not just the Jews, now get to experience this blessing of Abraham. The blessing didn't belong just to him. And to put it in terms that the Galatians would understand, now the entire world can hear the gospel and repent and believe and be part of this one family of God. It's no longer set in, 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 as just for the Jews. It's no longer taught that only the Jews can find salvation because God is saving from other flocks. But here's something else to consider about Paul's message. If you study the Hebrew or study the Greek, one of the the fun things that you get to do, if there is a fun thing in studying Hebrew and Greek, you start to, to look at whether a word is singular or plural. And it means a lot when you're reading something in context. And, and, and we do this in English too. If, if I said today, you're all, you're, if I say you're invited to my house, right, you're invited to my house, Do I mean just you, just the people in this church, or anybody that can hear my voice? If we're live streaming and there's 100,000 people listening, does that mean that they're all invited to my house today? My neighbors wouldn't like that. My wife wouldn't like that. The Greek word that Paul uses here is singular. He could have used the plurals, meaning that all of us, That there are many who would come from Abraham, but that misses the point. Here is where Paul lays everything out on the table. The promises given to Abraham find their fulfillment in Christ. So important. Abraham's true seed is Christ. Now take some time to read the genealogy in Matthew 1. Look who it traces Christ's lineage back to. It's back to Abraham. The blessings of Abraham find their fulfillment in Christ. This is not an accident. Now what this means is this flies in the face of individualistic Christianity, doesn't it? Many of you were converted through repeating a prayer or or, or through what what we call making a decision for Christ, and those are wonderful things. We celebrate those. We, We praise God for every person who comes to him, but what happens next? Did God save you to live a solitary life? Did God save you so that you could go build a cabin in the mountains and never talk to anybody? Or did he save you into a life in community, in a family of faith? 
See, the seed of Abraham is Jesus, and he is the head of our family. All Christians can trace our lineage back to Christ. Now, this is important because it's the source of our unity, too. In a moment, I'll talk about why all humanity is connected, why we all have a a, a connection spiritually, not just from our DNA, but spiritually as well. But what Jesus has done is unite us all in himself so there is no longer Jew or Greek. He fulfilled all of the works of the law so that he could unite his people. Now there's a theme that we've seen running throughout the book of Galatians already. And it's unity in the church through the gospel of Christ. It's the world changing idea that people from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue, people who have no connection otherwise, can be unified for one common cause. But to be honest, I just said something that's not true. I said that Christ brings people together who have no other characteristics that would unite them. That's not true. Every person, regardless of where they were born, how much money they have, what their last name is, what they've done, what they haven't done, every single person has been born of Adam. There's a common unity there, isn't there? And at the most basic level, there really are only two types of people in the world. First, those of born of Adam, born guilty. Every person besides Christ has been born with Adam's guilt. If you're wondering why the virgin birth matters, this is why it matters. Every human being has been born with Adam's guilt, the earthly father of humanity, and we all come from his line. What this means is that we've inherited the guilt of Adam's sin that he committed in the Garden of Eden. Now there's a sense in me, and probably in you, that wells up inside of me that that's not fair. How is it fair that one man's guilt can then sentence all of us to punishment and to death. How? How can that be? It just doesn't seem right that someone's guilt can be given to someone who's not guilty of committing that charge. First, even if it weren't for Adam's guilt, we'd all sin after him anyway. We would all stand guilty before God based on our own doing. But second, if you follow sports, what happens when a defensive lineman goes over the line of scrimmage before the ball gets snapped? Is it just that defensive lineman that gets punished? Or does the entire team suffer? To use a basketball terminology, what happens when a guy goes up for a shot and another guy fouls him? Is it just that player that gets punished? No, the entire team gets punished and the player who gets fouled gets free throws. How is that fair? Adam's sin is the same way. That because of Adam's sin, the rest of humanity suffers that guilt. The human team was penalized. Now, I know this concept may still be troubling to you, but doesn't it work the other way? And if you're a Christian, you should celebrate this because it works the other way. One man's guilt punishes us all. One man's righteousness gives us life. Through the righteousness of Christ, we are given life. Is that fair? Does that sound fair? And what Paul does in Galatians is show us that we have either Adam or Christ as our head. Adam is the head of sinful humanity. You stand in the works of Adam and you are doomed to suffer. The other head is Christ in whom we have the promise of eternal life. Look at Romans 5. It's a long passage, but Paul really expounds on this in Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Paul writes this, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, for the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign 
in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace may also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the same way that the guilt of Adam's sin was given to you, the righteousness of Christ can be given to you as well. To wipe out that curse, to wipe out that pain and suffering and punishment that we all earned. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul calls Jesus the last Adam. It's not a mistake. And in Galatians 3, Paul brings his comparison not between Adam and Christ, but between Abraham and Moses. Now, you may wonder, why in the world did you just spend all that time talking about Adam and, and, and Jesus? Why, why would you do that? It's because the results of those comparisons are the same. Look at Galatians 3.17. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about the law of Moses. God had already made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham was saved from his sin. Abraham was given life in the hopes of the Messiah. And this is the same way that you and I are saved. Through faith in Christ as the Messiah. It hasn't changed. His view was certainly clouded. He, he looked through a, a glass darkly. He couldn't see everything. We have everything now but we're still saved in the same way, through faith in Christ. And then the righteousness of Christ is then given to us. When you and I hear the gospel and we repent of our sin, that's a work of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. God gives us the faith to believe in him. The same God who gave Abraham the faith to believe is the same God who gives it to you. So here is where that Adam, Moses, and the Abraham, Jesus comparison happens. What does putting your hope in yourself bring? It's what Adam did, and it brought death. What about Moses and the law? That brings death too. So the first person that we've been talking about is the person who's born of Adam. It's every single human being. They're following the law, whether it's the law of God in the Old Testament or whether it's the law that they've determined to be right and good. Because we talked about this before. There are over 7 billion ideas of what is right. It's their standard. Those who are born of Adam will one day stand before God and have to give an account. A give an account for what they've done. And that's the only thing that they can cling to before God declares them guilty and unworthy. And whether people realize it or not, they are putting their hope in some way in the law. There's a list of things that they need to do, things that they need to accomplish, things that they need to do religious works. That's the only way that I can be made right, they think. They attempt to be good enough. The second person, the second type of person is the person who puts his faith in Christ. And his goodness. The law cannot save. Your goodness cannot save. Your faithfulness to this church, as much as we love it, cannot save. Only through the death of Christ can we be saved. And this is the promise that Christ gives. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. The idea of being an heir and receiving an inheritance is, it'll come up a lot more in the flowing, uh, following chapters in Galatians. But I want to mention this too. Paul is showing us the distinction between the law and the promise of God. The law says, do this. The law is a list of rules. You must do this. You have to do this. You, you got to keep doing this. The promise of God says, accept this. The promise of God says, 
Accept this so that you either don't have to do some of those things or you get to do those things and you're joyful about it. I want you to see how big that is. Now, I think all of us need to hear this. All of us need to understand this idea between law and grace. But I'll be honest, some of us here today need to hear this more than others. Maybe you've convinced yourself that your faith is something that you've earned or that's something that you have to maintain. Uh, maybe it's the way that you were raised or the church that you grew up in or, or a pastor that you've heard. You've been trained to do all of the right things. Maybe you don't think doing those right things gets you to heaven, but you have to do those things to maintain your status with God. But do you know what happens? It's like a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy, by definition, never gets smaller. Governments don't get smaller. They get bigger. A problem happens, they add more government to it, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It never stops, and it never goes away. And that's what happens with us. We keep adding to the stuff that we need to do, and while we do that, the pile gets so high that we can't see the freedom of the gospel anymore. We become bitter towards the church and all things religious because all that we see are rules after rules after rules. My guess, if that describes you, and I can't see your heart, but if that does describe you, my guess is that somewhere deep down you would say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You feel like giving up and leaving on your local church because it seems like rule after rule. Now, I want to say this as gently as I can because I've been there. I'm just as guilty of this, that I think you are likely misunderstanding the scope of the gospel. When you see that the freedom that lies in the gospel and how the church is the way that that gospel spreads, your vision is cleared so that all of those things that you've set up in place as a roadblock are wiped away. But here's a submission, uh, an admission in my life. I want rules. I want rules because they're safe. Rules are easily spelled out. So here's the 10 things I need to do today. I can get those 10 things done, and now I feel like I'm free. A good example of this is when someone asks me, they say, uh, Ryan, is it okay to, for a Christian to drink alcohol? It's easy to say no. Right? That's the easy thing. It's safe. You just say, no, you don't do it. You don't drink it. You don't, don't go near it. It's not as safe to say, well, in certain situations, yes, and in certain situations, maybe not. It's not as easy to say, well, you can, can just don't get drunk, but then we have to go through what is the definition of drunk. How much is too much? Is one drink too many, or two, or three? How does that work? Do you see the gray area that comes? It doesn't give us a definitive set of rules that we have to follow. There's risk. Where's the line in anything? We want lines, we want rules, we want standards, we want things that we have to do. And when they're not there, we panic. And we set rules up for ourselves. Do you ever wonder why some of you grew up in a church that outlawed dancing? You can't even line dance. And I get some kind of dancing. Why? Rules. Even though we know the end of the story in terms of the gospel, we know what the gospel brings us. It brings us life and life eternally. It's still risky. Giving up all of your desires, everything that you want, all of the things that you've built up for your life, giving all of that up is very risky. Being obedient to God may mean that you leave today, sell everything that you have, give it all to the poor, and go die on a mission field. That's risky. It may mean that you lose your friends. Because you're insistent that if they die today, they will spend eternity in hell, and your friends don't want to hear that anymore. You may lose your family. You may lose your jobs. See, the gospel is risky because it calls us to trust in a God that we cannot see. It calls us to live for something that we cannot feel. You know the outcome because you see it in Scripture, but the journey is lined with all sorts of dangers and snares. But on the other hand, 
the law offers some sense of security. It makes us feel good. I was speaking with someone the other day. Uh, TSA, they have the signs in the airport that we've captured these guns, we've captured these, but what they don't say is the stuff they didn't capture, stuff that got through. And as one person in our church said the other day, that's kind of a security theater. In the, in, the, in the best way, yes, they do good things, but in another sense, it just makes us feel good, doesn't it? And this is what the law does. It gives us this sense of security. It gives us this sense uh, that we're, being, uh, we're conforming, we're doing what we need to do to get it done. Let me ask you this. If I propose to you to go live in the mountains by yourself for a few weeks, and all you had was a tent and a knife, how many of you would be excited to go? Only you weird people who love the mountains and love the outdoors and love eating berries off of trees and all that, no air conditioning and stuff. Only you guys who are much braver than I am would want to go out and do that, right? Very few people. But here's this. What if I said, I need you to go out for two weeks or three weeks and do the same thing, a tent and a knife, but when you come back, I'm going to give you a check for $100 million dollars. I think we'd all probably go out there and do that. I don't need my medicine. I'm going to go out there and live. I'm going to be $100 million. I don't need medicine then. You'll have everything that you need. You'll have a house. You'll pay off your debt. You'll have multiple houses. You'll have multiple cars. You'll have vacations. You'll never have to do anything or worry about anything ever again. That's worth a few weeks in the woods. Even for someone like me who is scared of everything, I'd do almost anything for $100 million. A few weeks now sounds like a quiet retreat. Now, I hope you see that those who wanted to return to Judaism were seeing the Christian life as a few weeks in the woods with no payoff. The instant that they lost sight of the gospel as their main focus for living is when their descent back to the law began. They took their eyes off of the end goal and shifted it to the here and now. I've had many conversations with people about the way that I preach. And, and people have wondered. They said that, maybe, I haven't heard anybody preach like that. I, I, it's, been, it's been a surprise to hear the gospel preached on from every sermon. And it's, it's hard to see the gospel sometimes. We're going to be in Habakkuk soon. And how do you see Christ in Habakkuk? Or Obadiah? Or any of the Old Testament? And so I, I begin to, to share that, that I see Christ as the main focus of every page of Scripture. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm by no means the only one or even the best one. I'm way down on the scale of, of who's good at this. But I've been asked why I'm so convinced that this is the best way to preach. With a Christ-centered, gospel-driven focus. And, and maybe some of you have wondered that. Uh, first, I'm preaching to Christians primarily. This is a Christian worship service. This is not a Billy Graham rally. This is not a, a, a crusade or anything. This is a, a Christian worship service. And the more that I think, so were the churches in Galatia. This wasn't a crusade. These were churches. Having worship services. They were people just like us. And they wanted safety instead of risk. The question for you, Christians, today, 2,000 years later, in a Christian worship service, just like our brothers and sisters in Galatia, where are you at? Are you like the Judaizers? Are you, are you trying to cling to something that makes you feel safe and secure? Or are you willing to risk everything for the sake of the gospel? Trusting in Christ to meet your needs and give you the strength and courage to share the message of the grace of God is not easy. The path is covered with thorns and thistles. Hear the words of Christ this morning. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate that is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. I know it is so, so tempting to travel that easy path, isn't it? To go through the large gate where everyone's going through. It is so tempting, so easy to do that. It's clean, it's clear, there's nothing on the road. You can smooth sail, it's a paved road. 
The narrow path is hard. It's like walking in the woods with no trail cut. It's hard. It's not easy. Are you tempted to go that way? Jesus says that that road leads to destruction. The narrow path is hard, and it often means a a great deal of sacrifice on our part. But the payoff, and this is so important, the payoff is bringing glory to God and experiencing his grace and mercy. This is not just a message for people who are struggling with going back to Judaism. This is not just a message for those who don't know Christ. This is a message for Christians to remind us, keep our eyes on the prize. And who is the prize? The prize is Christ and his good news. The minute that we start building these rules and these laws like the Judaizers did is the the, the minute that we start taking our eyes off of Christ as our only Savior. This morning, if you haven't come to know Christ as your Savior, you don't have to walk down an aisle, you don't have to make a big show Do it right in your seat. Ask God to forgive you of your sins, and he promises that he will do that. If there's something in your life, Christian, that you have been running from God, if if God's calling you to a foreign mission field, or if God's calling you to serve in ministry in some way, shape, or form, whether it's cleaning the toilets or, or going to Zimbabwe, follow that. Don't run from that. Don't seek out those easy ways. Go through that narrow road. Follow after Christ. Trust in him that no matter what thorns and thistles you encounter, that Christ will hold you fast. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you have given us this life, given us this path that that, that we can follow you, that you have already trailblazed this for us. Lord, we know that this life has never been safe. We know that we're called to live a a dangerous life. Lord, because this life is not nearly as important as our one in eternity. Lord, one day we will sit with you, we will sing your praises in your presence, and compared to all of the difficulties that we face in this life, that is the best. To keep our eyes open on the glory of Christ and the amazing message of the redemption found in the gospel. That's our fuel. So Lord, I pray as we go out today that we not seek out the easy life, that we don't seek out those easy paths. Lord, that we can seek out your will for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name.